İyi akşamlar, hepiniz hoş geldiniz. Um, I'll switch to English from now. Hi. Um, we are welcoming as after the archive uh, Akram Zatari from Lebanon, a filmmaker and um, also a co-founder of the Arab Image Foundation, which has been an influential institution for our region, which inspired many other institutions, probably one being in Istanbul, for example, maybe SALT was inspired by that institution. And Akram is a filmmaker as well, and um, Akram has, uh, in 2000, I think, 14, has presented, uh, it was part, like, he was doing a solo show at SALT, and at that time, one of the pieces that he did uh, was about working progress uh, of the Sidon Necropolis excavations by Osman Hamdi Bey, the founder, also himself an artist, a painter, uh, and the founder of the Istanbul Archaeological Museum, which is the present name, Museu Humayun, the old name, the Imperial Museum. Um, we were interested in Akram's working progress because as after the archive, we are interested in uh, making talks or presenting some long-term research projects about public memory, excavations, archives, <clears throat> and uh, our last talk was about the Roman, uh, the gypsy communities in Turkey, and um, Akram's talk will touch on his, the recent developments of his working progress, and also give a little bit introduction about the excavation that happened in today's Saida, uh, present-day Lebanon. So without further ado, I want to, because most of you know Akram's work, I just want to present him the microphone and we welcome him to Postane. And also we want to thank Postane as well for generously supporting us with their venue. Thank you. Yeah, I have my... Thank you. Thank you, Kaken. Thank you to the After the Archive entity. I don't know if it's an association or it's just a group of um, interested uh, researchers or artists. Um, uh, thanks to SALT as well. Thanks to the Bogazici uh, University that in, in invited me in 2014 to spend um, a residency uh, for one month, commemorating 150 years uh, of founding that uh, institution. And since then, so many uh, things happened in Turkey and internationally that delayed this project or at least presented obstacles to its uh, realization. But uh, for those who know, know me, is really, I'm stubborn. I'm a very stubborn person. And uh, with age, things don't get better. You get more stubborn. So um, two years ago, with the beginning of uh, the economic default in Lebanon, with the beginning of uh, uh, uh, the COVID-19, I decided that this project is going to be my doctoral project. So I became a student, um, a researcher, artist at Sergi University in Paris. And um, I'm working under the directorship of both Francois Pernaud and uh, Benedict Savoy. And with, a, with a, what, what they call in, in French professional uh, uh, encadrement, of uh, Alejandra Riera, a brilliant artist and a dear friend. It's a project called Father and Son. And uh, the, the, the title does not bring at all uh, the issue of archaeology, nor the issue of um, uh, museum institutions withholding archaeological finds, nor talk about history. It's uh, Father and Son means lineage, uh, meaning something that started somewhere and led to another um, um, um, entity that retains um, aspects of um, an original or a former entity and continue it over time. And I'm, I've been working since the 90s on, on photography. Is, if photography is my favorite medium not to produce work with, but uh, what I call objects of study. I'm interested in uh, photographs as traces of past moments 
that include not only the past, but mix the past with the present, because their present is a form, is a practice, is a technology. Not only they don't bring up moments from the past, but they reenact the past in modern times. So um, here, what we, are, what we are looking at is a photograph uh, produced by Studio Alban. Alban is an Armenian uh, Egyptian photographer. His original name is Aram Arnavudian. So his former French teacher, probably you know what Arnavud is, no? In Turkish, yeah. right? Uh, Arnavud in Armenian means Albanian. So his French teacher called him Alban, l'Alban. And he became Alban, he used to sign as Alban, and this photograph, the original of this photograph, or the source of the image that you are seeing, is a negative. Why do you know that? I'm, I've inverted it to a positive. Why do you know it's a negative? Because these two lines on top and on bottom are cropping marks. So the photographer used to take the negative in his hands, draw, two lines or sometimes four lines and give it to his assistant to go print. And when this image was printed, it was printed like this. All this is besides uh, the idea of father son, but I like to bring with the knowledge that I'm showing you uh, the, the, the, the backlog, let's say, of the, of the making of, of the image. What I'm interested in here is uh, the, the head outfit because they, are, they look like father and son, they have similar eyes. It looks like there is a different posture, or at least um, each one has, has a slightly different style. The head outfit of the father is what can be seen as a ballady outfit, like popular outfit of a man who could be like a notable uh, in his community, but clearly the tarbush or the uh, I don't know if you call it tarbush in Turkey, we call it in Lebanon tarbush, the fez, the, the head outfit, it, it clearly makes out of the child or the son um, belonging to an urban uh, uh, context. He can, be, he can wear it in school, it could be part of his uniform, or it could be he is obviously belonging to a different category than his, fa his father, and despite the similarities between them, What's, what this photograph is commemorating, at the same time, it is commemorating the differences in their belonging to their times. Now I'm gonna bring, uh, uh, like we go to another uh, object completely. This is part of the uh, collection of the Metropolitan Museum and uh, I'm happy that Etem El Dem is with us because one time I asked him, did they really make uh, the sarcophagus of King Tabnit, did they really make it stand? Because I discovered this image um, when um, the company that I hired to give, um, to give a quotation for scanning 3D this object sent me a report with a quotation with this image. And I didn't, I was really shocked, like, uh, because I knew the museum in Istanbul uh, inaugurated a new um, museography of, um, of the permanent um, uh, archaeolog archaeological exhibition, and namely the, the, ex the collection that's coming from Sidon, the Royal Necropor Necropolis. But I had seen this five years ago in 2014 and 2015. The sarcophagus was uh, horizontal and not standing. But because the sarcophagus of, that is very similar of the son of King Tabnit, Eshmun Azar II, which is in, at the Louvre in Paris, because that sarcophagus was standing, and I like the fact that it was uh, standing because you see it really frontally, in, in, I thought, well, okay, maybe the, maybe the Istanbul Museum was, wanted to respond to this gesture of um, the standing son by actually asking the father to stand up. So it, I thought it would be this, but I realized that it's an object that is very close. It's almost identical to the sarcophagus of Tabnit, and this is sarcophagus of Harchebit. Um, it produced 50 years, or, or maybe, no, maybe 20 years before the sarcophagus of Tabnit that is uh, here. 
I'm bringing it, I'm putting it here because I looked online uh, on, for a picture of, uh, that shows you uh, the sarcophagus of Tabnit frontally without any distortion and I could not find. I am sure the museum has it, but it's not published. I have not seen it. And I wanted to explain to you something important. It's like the sarcophagus is made in such a way uh, that it has an empty plate here. And this, this is a curve. It's not really straight. It goes down and then it makes like this. And then there is an empty plate. On this empty plate, a family of, um, this is by the way, the sarcophagus that is at the Louvre. So this is the sarcophagus of King Ashmun Azar II. His grandfather is King Ashmun Azar I. His, his father is Tabnit, son of Ashmun Azar, and therefore the father of Ashmun Azar II. They happen to have in south of Lebanon, in Sidon, two Egyptian sarcophagi. We, they, um, we think they brought them from Egypt or either they bought them themse themselves or they received them as gifts because there were uh, Sidonians uh, worked with uh, the whole region, sometimes with Egyptians, sometimes with others. And they fought wars and therefore received uh, gifts and probably they wanted to distinguish themselves in their own community that, okay, we, are, we will be buried in sarcophagi that were made elsewhere in a powerful culture, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a distinguished uh, culture that is Egyptian. So for them, it's an issue of status as well. When the sarcophagus of Eshmun Azar II was discovered, 32 years before the discovery of this one. So this is older in the world of archaeology, but uh, it contained a younger person. This is younger in the world of archaeology because that was excavated in 18, uh, uh, sorry, 1887, and uh, Ashmun Azar II was excavated in 1855. So there is between them 32 years. When that was discovered, no one knew what happened because only later, after the discovery of uh, uh, Tabnit, they realized that this sarcophagus has been erased and therefore covered with Phoenician. Here you see uh, ancient Egyptian writings. On the sarcophagus of Tabnit, you see that this area that was empty is now covered with uh, uh, Phoenician inscription. This is, this is a different language than that. But because the, the, the son died 14 years after the father, the family had a sarcophagus that is full of Egyptian, and they had aim, ample time to customize it, change it. I once bought uh, an Apple uh, uh, laptop. This is not mine and I took it to someone to inscribe my signature on it. And I, always, I, I was always saying to my friends, I authored um, uh, an Apple product. So what this family has done, they authored something that they did not um, um, uh, produce themselves, something that their culture did not manufacture, something their, their culture was not even able to manufacture. This kind of stone did not exist in Lebanon. It's a black stone, very similar to um, uh, basalt, but it's not basalt, it's very similar to basalt that did not exist in Lebanon. And the know-how of it well, to make it demands a know-how that did not exist neither in Lebanon. So this is uh, the sarcophagus of uh, Tabnit, King Tabnit, in the Istanbul Museum before the current uh, display. This picture has been taken in 2014. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the Sidon ne Necropolis. I don't know how many of you have seen the, um, the new display or the old display. I don't know how, if you are familiar with, uh, with, with um, the excavation, but uh, to bring, to tell you uh, shortly what 
what people in the 19th century would be li looking for when, when they dig. They would be looking for a traces of a shaft in the earth. So if you are, if you are um, um, planting your, your land, your farm, and if you are removing some soil, and when you find a rectangle uh, with soil in it and soil outside it, you kind of knew that this is probably an access to a former grave of an older culture. So the story goes as follows. One day, um, a guy named Mehmet Sharif, in Saida they would say Muhammad, not, not Mehmet, but anyway, Muhammad Sharif was uh, um, doing was doing works in his land. He is a mason himself, so you imagine he got hold of a piece of land with a lot of rocks in it, and uh, uh, hired people to come and cut the rocks. And you know, while cutting the rocks, you kind of uh, uh, removing layers of um, the new rock, the new soil, and then you go down in earth. And he, he, one of his uh, guys saw uh, something like this, and then they continued the adventure. I don't know what... Yeah, I don't know, something is wrong, but... Ah, okay. They went down on the right, there were, ca there were caves, and on the left there were caves. There were not really caves because uh, later when you see drawings of that necropolis, you, f you see lintels, so it's not really caves. Uh, there is some kind of construction. It's not a monumental construction, but it's a uh, like modest uh, construction. Here I put, because I, I redrew this excavation based on the annotations of Osman, Osman Hamdi Bey. So these are sections that, l when you look at the plan, these, this is a section that is like that. <clears throat> and here I put the, the number of the vault. So vault one included the sarcophagus 17, and those, the numbers were given by Osman Hamdi Bey himself. The vault two uh, is, is sarcophagus number three. Um, just, I'm going to quickly go through it. This is how they extracted them. Because we are talking about uh, 1887, and we are talking uh, between, 12, uh, between um, 10 and 12 meters. This shaft goes down in earth 10 or 12 meters. So to remove a sarcophagus that is between 3 and 5 tons, you'd better be smart. In, like in, in uh, creative, in, in, in finding ways. So the uh, in finding ways to extract it. The, this is a plateau that is higher than this area. So what they decided to do is that they decided to create a tunnel to bring, to extract all these sarcophagi out of earth without needing to raise them, uh, lift them 11 um, Meters. I'm still impressed how they, did, how they did it. They had kilometers to, to reach the seaside where the ferry was or where, where, where the ship um, was waiting for them. Okay, this is a different section that tells you that sometimes where the, they found uh, uh, sarcophagi buried under other sarcophagi. So all of this is a, looks like a nice adventure to us, but think of times where they did not have batteries, they did not have electricity, so they had to really suffer uh, uh, in those places and, and run through risks of um, uh, falling earth on them, killing them. So this is something that happened uh, in a month's time starting from end of April, I think, 1887 onwards. And in June, in the beginning of June or July, uh, the material was shipped to Constantinople. So each one of the sarcophagi followed a different style that is linked to a different geography. And when I saw this, I was like, my God, this is typically Lebanese, typically. Th these, these people from and that's only my observation. This is not a scientific observation. But when you, look, when you look at the alliances in Lebanon today, the political alliances, you see like a major part of the population follow Iran, therefore Persia. And another part of the population uh, follow the Sunni leadership of Saudi Arabia, 
of uh, uh, the UAE and Egypt. Well, Egypt was very strong in those times. Persia was very strong in those times. And whoever follows today uh, European or international community would follow, I mean, part of that population would follow Greece. So the styles are either Greek or Egyptian or, or, or um, um, different um, styles that are not made in Lebanon. Okay, and the most interesting event during this uh, excavation period is the discovery of a second shaft. But they did not discover this shaft B on Earth they discovered this shaft when they realized that th there, there was a point of touch or point of contact between two subterranean um, labyrinthine um, uh, structures that made uh, a point here very like too close and therefore Osman Hamdi Bey when he visited here, this, he realized that there was an opening in the ceiling of this room. So he asked people to bring down ladders and access this room. And then when they accessed this room, they realized that it's actually a burial site for, for something that was accessed from that room. And then from that room, they realized that there was a shaft, so they went up uh, back to the ground and then um, uh, excavated this whole thing and found actually two rooms from both sides. That was closed, that was opened. They didn't find anything important here, but they, they had come anyway through this room. They broke this uh, wall and then they realized, this is for me a very beautiful encounter, a very beautiful room they walk into a room that didn't have anything except a different floor. And then when he saw that the floor, when he realized what the floor is, he was 100% sure that there is something buried underneath that has not been yet looted because all what he had found here had already been broken by looters. He didn't find treasures, he didn't find uh, uh, corpses, maybe one corpse was dissolved into like, uh, uh, uh, into a sarcophagus with liquids. They didn't get hold of anything. But when he went in this room, he saw beams on the floor uh, crossing the room this way. A number of beams, six or eight, I don't remember. He asked uh, the team to come and start breaking those beams. When they broke those beams, they saw a surface that is 340 by 180, which means the length of a human being as width and the length of three people or two people, uh, one, um, in the ancient times, they did not have concrete. So we are talking about a stone that is a single piece that is very well polished and that's brought down 10 or 11 meters underground. So around it, there were gravel. He asked the uh, uh, workers to dig the gravel to um, to make room, to make void, to see how deep does this rock go into Earth. And they dug almost one meter and they realized that this stone is one even more deeper in the ground. And then here I, th I imagine him with his heart beating so ex much excited that there is something definitely hiding under this piece of stone. And the discovery or the hid treasure is so important that ancient cultures decided to seal it with such a huge piece of stone that is so well crafted. So it, for him, it's a sign of respect to whoever is sleeping 
uh, under, under it. What he does immediately is he asks his people to come and start breaking this stone. So from all the pieces that he collected, this is a piece that he had to sacrifice. Uh, I have to tell you how I, re I discovered all of this. In uh, 2014, when I came to Bogazici University, I met Atem. He told me about the beautiful uh, manuscript that uh, Osman Hamdi Bey left or produced after his excavation. And it's called the Roy um, uh, Une Necropole Royale à Sidon. Um, he wrote it, co-wrote it in French with uh, Théodore Renac. And it was produced in Paris. It came out in 1892, which is five years after the, ex the excavation. Luckily, in 1986, some association in Istanbul decided to uh, republish a facsimile of, of, this, uh, of this book. And I'm trying to find, if I find it easily, I'll tell you, because I'm interested to know more about this association who, which in, a, in 1986 produced in Turkey something in French and never um, translated in Turkish. Um, why in 1886? Because I think they realized that this is, um, this run out of, uh, must have run out of, uh, out of rights, like it became public domain. So anyone could today uh, uh, reproduce it in any language. I plan to reproduce it in Arabic and publish it in, in the Arab, for Arabic uh, readers. And, I think it is important uh, to see it also published in Turkish, and I, I hope to work on this as well. So, um, uh, this is a beautiful um, a record of one month and a half that Osman Hamdi Bey spent in Saida. In the first uh, two pages, he describes how he goes uh, to Saida and at the entrance of the city, every time he passes a new piece of land, someone is digging. So imagine this fever of uh, going to places where everyone is looking down in earth for something from the past, not necessarily because they are interested in finding it, but for the potential of making money out of selling it to European travelers or European institutions through dealers who live in their part of the world, but who have the connection and speak European languages and therefore can sell those items to uh, European uh, institutions and collectors. And um, we will go further in, in like, it, this is an amazing record for me because he's talking about my town. He's talking about uh, th four generations before me. And I had not uh, uh, read something so, uh, so direct about Sidon from that, from that part of uh, the world. Let alone my interest in Hamdi Bey comes also like was uh, uh, heightened when I learned that he was an artist and not uh, a historian, not an archaeologist. Maybe archaeologists of his time did not really believe in his uh, potential, in his capacities of leading uh, uh, a work such as this one in Saida, and that was really for him an, an, inaugural, uh, uh, of, of an inauguration of a practice. He has done uh, before that excavation, other ex uh, maybe one or two excavations in Turkey, but that for him, that uh, the because of, because, of, because of what Sidon represented in European consciousness, uh, n namely because the mission, the French mission of 1860 uh, to Lebanon excavated uh, important sites, important, important Phoenician sites, so he is aware that something important is taking place on the coast of Lebanon from Byblos to Tyr, including Saida. So when he got signs that, they, that something was found, he immediately went to oversee the excavation himself and uh, he produced this. 
So, this stone is completely destroyed to reach the sarcophagus of King Tabnit. When he saw the sarcophagus of King Tabnit, he immediately saw the similarity to Eshmunazar, uh, Eshmunazar's sarcophagus, uh, sarcophagus that is at the Louvre. And he immediately uh, uh, uh, knew that he succeeded in his, uh, in his succeeded in, get, in getting hold of something that would enrich knowledge about the Phoenicians. And also give a chance to an empire to be visible or to compete with other uh, um, empires or other cultures, namely the French, the British, the Germans, that now archaeology in the empire is possible, it has been inaugurated. So they lift the sarcophagus, they find a way to take it through that uh, shaft that I showed you before, and then it's over. They tell Mehmet Sharif, thank you very much, we took, we extracted what is necessary and all what remains does not interest us. Please feel free in cutting the rocks the way you were doing. And the people um, of the generation of my parents tell me that that site always was kind of, um, had a sudden fall in the middle, um, like a, a fossé, like a, a ditch, a huge ditch. Why? Because the, the, the, the masons, of Saida cut everything, cut everything and produced a void. They did not know that uh, the fabric that contained the sarcophagi might have, have its own um, um, cultural elements, um, knowledge about how people of, of Phoenicia, how people of old Saida um, practiced building or cutting, we, th there's, we lost uh, something. But maybe something that's not extremely important, but we lost uh, uh, knowledge. What remained of this is the descriptions of that necropolis as uh, produced, written, and then uh, uh, published by Hamdi Bey. From all, of, from all of this, I started um, first with a drawing, and then I built um, a, a model um, that, that shows all these rooms, a model that is really based on, um, uh, on, on, on the detailed uh, um, drawings. And then I um, started recently, uh, only in like last year, in, in September, I started waiting for the authorizations to scan archaeological objects that were extracted out of Saida and found themselves in nowadays Turkey and France. Of course, they made me wait seven years, but it's okay, I, I can wait more, it's, it's totally fine. But I wanted to, to, to produce also, to start producing. So it's okay, okay, at least thanks, thanks to Hamdi Bey who destroyed this, uh, this piece of stone, it doesn't belong to anyone, so I can still reproduce it. So based on his um, drawings, I reproduced it. And this is a scale one to five, of course. Uh, the, the, the real one would, would uh, weigh a few tons, so it's really hard to transport it anywhere in the world. But I'm interested uh, uh, in the stone because it has important traces, what I call ears. Osman Hamdi Bey doesn't call them ears. These eight grooves that are made uh, to hold this, this piece of stone with ropes and bring it down a shaft that is 10 meters underground, and then move it laterally uh, another 10 meters and bring it down <laughs> also two meters without breaking it. It demands um, um, a skill that in nowadays Lebanon doesn't exist for sure, without having electricity, without having, I mean, you had some mechanics for sure, um, but you know the Phoenicians, uh, 
produced ships and uh, carried tons of things between country to, uh, and, and country, and they probably have lifted Eshmunaz, uh, Eshmunazar's sarcophagus and Tabnit's sarcophagus from an Egyptian port and put them on their own ships 2,000 years ago. So it's, it's interesting to go in this. And then I asked uh, a marine, uh, um, like, like someone who is uh, simply, um, who sells accessories to uh, uh, boats and yachts and, okay, what kind of rope shall I use and what, what shall I try? How should, he said, it's so simple. The trick is the less um, ties you have, a nœud, uh, what do you call the nœud? Oh. Yeah, the less knots you have, the more solid is your, um, your carrying. So the trick was to use those eight ears to lift the stone without any uh, tying. So it goes like the stone was on the floor and I, I didn't believe it's gonna work, but when the, with the first trial, it worked perfectly. Uh, this stone was 250 kilos, which is nothing for uh, larger, larger objects. So we got, um, a rope from that store in Hamburg. Um, it's six millimeters uh, thick. It fits perfectly that, um, those ears. And then we started with uh, the anchor and then made this go up again and then go, go to the second one again and then go to the third one again and then to the fourth one again and et cetera, et cetera. And then you make a loop doing a typical marine knot without any tying, actually. It's a simple marine knot, and we lifted it, it stood. It's really exciting, for me it's really exciting. So the exercise of, uh, of making this piece of stone is to just see, okay, how did they do it? How, I'm sure maybe, maybe I did not uh, do exactly what they did, because I do not claim in reading uh, um, a Phoenician minds uh, cannot read a Phoenician mind, especially something that happened 2,000 uh, and, and 500 years ago. But at least I know it is possible. So this is a, this is a close up of it. Uh, here, what you see here is simply a clamp, something that opens and, close, and closes. And, and therefore, because I was told this should be the minimum. So the, the better to bring it down. So we tied it and it's, it's perfect. And this is showing now in Hamburg in, at Sverzamler's gallery uh, in Admiralitätsstrasse. So I'm, I, yeah? No, no, no, uh, no, no, well, I, uh, yeah, I'll see you. Um, A piece I've done before, this is really the last piece. The last piece that is a reconstruction of something that doesn't exist anymore, hoping to uh, work on reproducing um, what, I, what I like to call informative objects. I'm just going to tell you uh, quickly what is an informative object in my, in my mind. You know, in anatomy classes, they would have um, a human being, um, most probably naked, but as in, not a real human being, a statue of a human being. And you can take part of the stomach out and you see behind it uh, how are the organs linked together inside. So it's like a schematic object. It's not really, because you cannot do, a, you cannot bring a real human being and facing um, uh, like um, medical students starts cutting part of the um, skin to show you what's behind. What they do is that like they use uh, uh, uh, schematic objects that are built for that specific purpose. So for me, an informed object is an object that I like to create to tell a story of an object that looks like it. So what I plan to do with, uh, with, the, with the project Father Son is to ask the Louvre to allow me to scan in 3D the sarcophagus of uh, Eshmun Azar II 
and I work on it, and I bring, it, bring uh, this informed object to Istanbul Museum, and install it in the same room where the sarcophagus of his father exists today. Standing, or I don't know how, but whenever I will be allowed to scan that object, I will work, I mean, I would need six months or a year of a creative process to produce uh, uh, uh, out of it an informed object. And I would do the same if the Istanbul Museum allows me to uh, scan the sarcophagus of Tabnit, I would go to the Louvre and saying, okay, I have a new object that we can install next to the uh, uh, sarcophagus of Eshmun Azar II that would bring the sarcophagus of his father that's today in Istanbul. Because in 2014, neither Istanbul mentioned uh, the sarcophagus of Eshmun Azar II at the Louvre, nor the Louvre mentioned anywhere in their publications or on the website that the sarcophagus of the father exists in Istanbul and it looked like that, etc., etc. And for me, uh, the two uh, sarcophagi are not linked primarily because a, a father was buried in one of them and the son was buried in the other them. No, because the sarcophagus themselves are derivative one from the other because one of us told us how the other one was erased. We, we could not have uh, realized how, what was the original form of Eshmun Azar II, the sarcophagus of Eshmun Azar II, had we not found uh, uh, Tabnit that is today in. So it, it is essential to have them together. Well, um, Hélène Lemo later in, in 2018 told me and pointed out why, while she was doing research on, uh, she's from the Louvre, she is uh, uh, responsible for the Phoenician section at the Louvre, she told me that actually in the early 20th century, the Louvre had a print of the sarcophagus of its Munazar hanging outside the room where the sarcophagus, uh, uh, sorry, uh, a stamp of, from uh, Tabnit, which was in Constantinople, uh, hanging uh, outside the room where the sarcophagus of uh, Eshmunazar II in Paris was. So someone in the past had thought of doing this link institutionally, but it was removed later and they don't even know where it is. I don't, they don't even know what kind of it. Was it gypsum? Was it, um, we, we don't know. So today, both museums, uh, eight years later, both the museums make reference to, to, to each other. So I'm not the only one who is seeking um, uh, uh, enriching knowledge or in, enriching the world of, of, of archaeology or, or museums with, with further links that bring together these two sarcophagi, but the institutions are, I think, are interested in creating this, um, these links. Whether they are capable of doing it or not, I'm not sure. Well, as, as we said, uh, Hamdi Bey was an artist. He is a painter. One of the most beautiful paintings of his, maybe Etem will, will read. The student lying on a daybed, uh, lying on his belly and reading. It's really amazing. Um, they look a little bit orientalist, but if you observe them from a close distance, like the turtle players, uh, player, um, the, the guy with turtles, who the magician of player, I don't know how you call him, someone who orchestrates uh, or play with turtles and trains turtles, uh, is also an amazing, um, it, there, there is some kind of locality, but also an appartenance to, uh, to, to mainstream postures, but always with a little attention to a detail that makes out of him really talking about of his culture. He's obviously talking about his own culture and not talking about another culture. Anyway, Hamdi Bey was interested in photography. So we started by, by a photograph from, from Egypt made by an Armenian photographer in, in, in, um, in Cairo. And here, Osman Hamdi Bey is interested in photography. He speaks about photography seven times in his book, Insider. Things like, Thank you. 
Things like, it was noon, workers needed to rest and have lunch. I took advantage of this break to make a photograph of this beautiful lid. Probably he's talking about this, not this. Maybe this one, this is also a lid. On page 60, he says, Monday, May 23, sarcophagus number seven is brought finally to the ground, climbing the ramp slowly, the ramp that I showed you. Given its weight, it moves by the centimeter. Really, it's a different notion of speed, different notion of time. Towards noon, the most beautiful funerary monument of antiquity known to us today has taken its place behind its lid in the orange grove. I told you there, there was um, a denivellation in, in, the, in Earth. There is a high plateau of rocks, and then a sudden cliff of seven meters or six meters. I took a beautiful portrait of my uncle with Etamel Dem there. If you don't have it, I'm happy to send it to you. Um, because we could not climb the other, the other way, we went to the place where this tunnel was, um, um, was dug to extract uh, the sarcophagi. So on the other side, on the lower part, after the denivellation, there was an orange grove that belonged to Shibli Abella. Who is this Shibli Abella who is mentioned several times in Osman Hamdi Bey's... Um, and I never, when, when I read his... Uh, I know the, the Abella family is extremely known. In, uh, it comes from a European family that came um, probably to the region in the 18th or 19th century, and they were all... Um, merchants, um, and they became very known, and they became locals. Um, Shibli Abella comes from a Christian family. They are not Muslims, they are European, but they, they lived and they became local. And uh, I always ask myself a stupid and naive question. Did he ever offer Hamdi Bey a glass of wine? Do we know if Hamdi Bey drank wine or not? He did. Yeah, he. So he always talks about how generous is Abella. And when you read uh, what happened 32 years earlier, you realize that there must have been something happening between the Abellas and the Ottoman Empire. Habib Abella, who is the uh, a relative of, of Shibli Abella, tried to stop. Um, uh, Alphonse Durigello from taking away the sarcophagus of Eshmoun Azar II out of Lebanon. And they sued each other and they went to court, both of them, the Ottoman Empire assigned a Euro European court saying, okay, when two Europeans fight or like have a discussion under the uh, Ottoman rule, it's a European court, court that uh, judges them. And the European court judged that it is okay for Alphonse de Rigello uh, to take hold of the sarcophagus of Eshmoun Azar II. So therefore, Habib Abella does not have the right to, uh, uh, to keep the sarcophagus. I wonder if this played any role in this rap rapprochement between, between uh, uh, Shibli Abella and, uh, uh, and Osman Hamdi Bey. But here we see that Shibli Abella offered the orange grove. This is the orange grove of Shibli Abella, where we stood with Adam Eldem and, and, and my uncle. Uh, uh, and this became like a little museum for a short period of time. I don't remember if it's like a week or 10 days. Uh, whenever they brought a new object, they displayed it there and people would come, locals would come and watch, and uh, Hamdi Bey insisted that no European representative would, or like no uh, council would come and watch without his authorization. So it's an issue of sovereignty. All of a sudden, digging for past uh, remnants of past cultures 
um, has to do with sovereignty. For a long time, it was commerce, exactly like fishing, exactly like hunting. You know, in Lebanon, until today, you cannot tell hunters you don't have the right to go fire on specific type of birds that are not edible. They insist on their right in hunting. People must have thought that everything that's under earth belongs also not to the whole community, but to ever, whoever finds it first. And this is exactly like the main, the main issue with, uh, uh, with robbery, is that for a long time there were no, um, there were no uh, regulations vis-a-vis -vis antiquity in the Ottoman Empire. Coll correct me if I'm wrong, but it's 1884, the, the, the last time or the first time, some, like between 1870s and 1880s, it has been regulated. 69, first one. 69, okay. 69, 74 and 84, three, three laws that succeeded. The first one was probably missing uh, s certain um, details and then it was uh, like updated and then updated third time in 1884. Therefore, this is why it was so legal. Even what, when, when the sarcophagus of Ishmun Azar II reached a court officially, someone is about to rob this, rob the city, this huge uh, cultural monument. And uh, the court says, of course, it's legal. And it was sold to Duc de Luyne, who donated it to the Louvre in the same year, or it was displayed in 1856. So this is why when the second sarcophagus, or like when Mehmet Sharif found something on earth, I'm not surprised if he tried to sell it first and then could not, because something that weighs three, four, five tons times 17, is like you cannot, uh, like you cannot make uh, an elephant go through um, a tiny, um, so therefore the state or the empire needed to know, the vilayet officials needed to know. So, talking about uh, photography. We are talking, um, these photographs were, were not like this when I found them. These are photographs that either Hamdi Bey himself took, I still, there's a huge question mark uh, uh, about whether he framed and pressed the button because he thanks the Seba uh, uh, institution for the in very, um, important um, photographic institutions over generations, the Sebah, uh, uh, the, the Sebahs. I don't know if they only printed these or if they sent with him someone to take pictures. But I'm not surprised if he himself took photographs. You can tell probably, he, did he possess cameras? Yes, he did it in 1883 and then moved on. Uh-huh, okay. So so most probably, and this explains why he is not in the pictures. He is not in any of the pictures that form one of the albums of the Sultan Abdul Hamid collection dedicated to Saidun, entitled Saidun Lahdi. So um, this is not in the album. You see, Koken, it's like it, it's not curved. This is published in, in his book when they found the sarcophagus of uh, Tabnit, they opened it and they found the corpse of Tabnit still there. They took, it was uh, drowning in special liquid. They took it out, it was straight, but as uh, uh, Zinab Kazeltan, uh, the former, the former uh, director of the uh, of the Istanbul Museum explained to us when we, when he visited. Uh, she said there was a malady that attacked this uh, this corpse somewhere in the 20th century, and it was curved and it lost uh, the living. Uh, we we don't know uh, 
if in the 19th century the DNA was still active or not, but when they tried to examine the DNA uh, of King Tabnit, they could not find any, uh, uh, any active um, samples. This is one of the uh, special photographs because Mehmet Asi, the, the, the Vilayet uh, uh, marine engineer of, of Saida, uh, was proud to build this. Of course, he is mentioned in, in Hamdi Bey's uh, uh, in Hamdi Bey's transcript, but um, uh, I was surprised that the family of, of Mahmoud Asi know so much details about, they were never asked, how, what do we know and what, what do they have? They showed me the contract between the Vilayet or, and, uh, and, and, and Mahmoud Asi in which um, I'm, I'm going to show you maybe um, a, a video, a sh short video of uh, uh, the grand grandson of, um, of, of Mahmoud Asi telling me. Wh wh where would I find them here, the videos, by the way? No, it's fine. It's uh, Zahir. Zahir Abu Alfa is a. Um, medical doctor we we like literally inside that this is a guy i have pictures of together with him when i was six months so I imagine like uh, i i didn't i mean i addressed as addressed few questions around me and so many people like it was not really difficult to, to do it all what i'm saying كان سأل بصيدا مين العامل أو المختص اللي ممكن يساعده بنقلون من البستان المغاير على محلة الشمعون قالوا له ما في إلا عنا بيني سفن بصيدا اسمه محمد العاصي واختصاصه أنه ينقل سفن كبيرة كانت يعملوا سفن كبيرة وقتها بصيدا مش سفن شخطير صغيرة مراكب صغيرة ستة وسبع متار كانوا يعملوا سفن كبيرة This is something that's really it, it's fascinating for me. أنه بتاريخه قد جرت المقاصة. It's like the, the, the agreement. فيما بين قائم مقيم قائم مقاميات صيدا فريق واحد قائم مقيم of صيدا as one entity. وبين محمد محمد ابن خليل العاصي مسلم عثماني. That's why I'm saying this. The first information that comes in a contract about this person is the fact that he's Muslim. The second information is that he's Ottoman. Just because um, in the texts of that period, you very, like you are surprised at like, why would the American Journal of Archaeology talk about a person as a Muslim in 1887? When you go back in uh, contextualize this document in what was happening in Lebanon back then, of course, of course, this is an official document. It's not meant to talk about religion, it's meant to, to, to make a deal with an engineer. What does religion have to do with this? But it is there. So anyway, it goes, it goes like this, and therefore it s divides the work um, تدفع قائم مقامية صيدا من صندوق خزينتها. So قائم مقامية of of صيدا uh, pays from its own money to this guy based on the authorizations uh, that were sent from uh, uh, Constantinople to Sidon, etc., etc. They detail the work like the first lifting of the pieces out of ground would would be equivalent of so and so. Taking the material from, from uh, that location to the seaside would, be, would cost that much. Taking the material from the, from the uh, uh, seaside to the ship would cost that much. So this is why I wanted you to, and I always feel when I work in Lebanon that how come did like no one ever knock on this door? Because like it's the first time you address, you'd call someone asking for information, and they have it. 
they have it and they just like nobody ever asked for it. Contra Mufassal bil atayb li mumkin yatu yaha yitqadaha an naql al nawawis marhali bi marhali. Kil marhali ila al ajr taba. Marhali traf al nawawis min taht al ard la wuj al ard. Marhali naklun la shat. Marhali musaadi bi naklun ala al marakib al usmaniye. اللي وقت اسطنبول بعتتها خصوصي لنقلهم لاسطنبول وعملوا اسئله سقاله اسكاله عملوها خصوصي على شط الشمعون على شط محلة الشمعون لينقلوا النواويس لاسطنبول النواويس كثير ثقيله ناوس الاسكندر بحدود ال 5 طن وزنه لما كان الونش من المركب يرفعوا على على المركب كان بيقولوا الوالد يعني سمع من جدي ومن الكبار انه كان البابور او المركب يميل بحدود ال 45 درجه على على الماء من تقل من وزن النواويس الثقيل سو اي دونت نو اف اي اف اي ميس ذا بارت وير هي توكس اباوت ذيس اند هي سيز ذا وورد اسكالت ويتش از نوت ان عربي وورد And I, t I told him, well, in Arabic, we say s'ali, s'ali or s'kali, but we do not say the qaf. We say s'ali. So he insists on telling me iskalet. And then I tell him, what is this? He's like, yes, in Turkey, they call s'ali iskalet. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's still. And I said, hey, how come you know? He said, I have been studying Turkish for two years, uh, Turkish language. And uh, what, what, what for? He said, no, nothing. It's like it's part of my obligation towards my family and towards all this past that I need to understand Turkish in order to uh, keep on explaining the situation. It's like I was fascinated in a country where most people um, uh, compete going to an American university or a French universe, French speaking university. Nobody talks about going to an Arabic speaking university, but some people are interested in Turkish culture because they think without understanding uh, a, a Turkish culture or without speaking Turkish terms, they cannot read uh, Ottoman. They, ca they cannot understand aspects of their own culture that has been formed by a succession of, a succession of, of cultures And they are not interested, interested in deciding from a palette of cultures, okay, do we identify with Phoenicians or French or Ottomans or others? They want to identify with all of them because without the summary of all of them, they are not who they are. And this is an essential uh, position, not nowadays, because this is a minority position. Only elites would think Uh, uh, in those terms. Only elites that are enlightened are able to uh, uh, jump over the, the conflicts between cultures and realize that they, their traits are made with a palette and not with a single one of any. How can you dissociate European from Ottoman? I cannot. I'm saying this because These two museums made my life difficult over the eight years. And nowadays, I, really, no, no, it's like, it, it, where does authority come from? You are not born with authority. You gain authority thanks to years of political practice. And I have the right to say, excuse me, I am a researcher, I'm an artist, I'm, my, I'm from Saida, this is my culture. And I do not buy the fact that you are the guardians of something that is supposed to belong to humanity. The essence of the project is there. The essence of the project is really, I'm not interested in, uh, in bringing a court to decide who owns what. I'm not interested in the original anyway, and I'm not interested in any nationalistic perspective of calling for bringing this, these back to their original cultures. Technology nowadays, namely 3, 3D recordings, allows us to seize all the details in an artifacts and forget about the original. It will be kept somewhere in a museum, in a, in a cemetery. In, it, could be, it will be kept. I even say they should be 
they, stay, they should stay outside light, away from, from light. I'm really uh, skeptical about the museum as the, as the final habitat or of, of, of the archaeology of the world, where people go and buy tickets and go uh, contemplate an, uh, um, an, an ar a funerary artifact that is uh, uh, like strongly lit when it lived 2,000 years away from light. I don't understand museographers who just take the easiest solution and bring it and put hundreds of, of projectors on, on this object. It was not supposed to be seen like this. It, was, it may not have supposed to be seen, period. So without bringing, like, I do agree that it's important to, um, as, as, a, as a field of study, scientific research is extremely important to be done about these objects. But whoever invented the museum did not know that the cost of, of, of maintaining the museum has become so high that without, um, without advertising agencies and without charging costs on every document and without draining national resources in order to keep the museum, you cannot continue. And therefore, you start selling images of, of archaeology and uh, to, to, um, to, to sellers, they pay the museum a lump sum or they pay the museum per use. And all of this is, um, I don't know where these people got the authorizations to do it when we agree that no one owns culture, no one owns humankind. And, but the practices of selling culture has been uh, legitimized since a long time ago. I am not really a historian. I'm an artist that uses channels uh, um, um, uh, paved by historians, and I operate like bees operate in, uh, in landscapes. So, these are objects that are not supposed to see the light, and I decide to erase them by bombarding them with light and to produce glow. In other terms, taking from images that were taken in places that have not seen cameras before, taking from them the essential parts that invited the camera to this place. Hamdi Bey did not bring his camera to take pictures of peasants, to take pictures of Saida locals. He brought the camera to take pictures of archaeology on the location, proving that he has digged or extracted, extracted archaeology in Saida, and you see with the Saida people. So they are there, kind of additional information. What I'm, t what I'm doing in these images, I'm depriving the viewer from the full um, uh, uh, description to favor or in favor of the elements that did not mean much for Hamdi Bey. Probably, I'm not, I cannot, uh, but the green, the people who are a little bit blurry, yet standing and not believing what this machine is, looking into the machine, they, they might not have seen pictures before. They might not have been photographed before. And this is a series of eight images that I based on uh, the Sultan Abdul Hamid's um, uh, collection, the album of Saidun Lahdi. And here, anyway, um, the, I'm interested in the workmanship. I'm interested to see exactly like how did they created this track, uh, all these laborers. Um, some of these images were on display in the former, at the museum in the former uh, um, display of the collection. I did not see them now. I think they have been removed, but they are very much accessible and they are in, in the transcription of Hamdi, Hamdi Bey's... Uh, this is one of the pieces I did. It's a very quick piece. You will not see it well. And this goes, that, that tells you how I did, why I did the images, the, the single photographs. And this is the layout of the album. 
and here it says um, uh, ah this is Hakamdar so so this is probably Hakamdar I don't know or Insider Tabnit ah, whatever I just someone who knows Ottoman can read this. Aha, uh -huh. okay. It's the image that has most people. This must have been sometimes in May 1887 in Bustan Lamgara uh, in Saida. Archaeological finds have just been lifted up from 10 meters below earth level. They are placed on the ground in a citrus grove where they will remain for a few days before they are transported on a ship on a ship named Asir to Constantinople. Until that moment in 1887, the finds have spent more time in the dark than in daylight. Here in the grove at this moment in time, they are getting exposed to light for the first time in more than 2,000 years. During those years, these finds have been subject to violence by looters looking for treasures. They have just been extracted from below earth by men using ropes, pulling them and sliding them upwards on a wooden track. At this specific moment, finds are posing for Hamdi Bey's camera. The darkness of the burial chambers would not have been suitable for photograph captures. Many, f many have been invited to have a look at these objects before they are transported away from Sidon. Most pictures taken in Bustana Lamgara around that event would typically show large, large ornamented stone pieces resting on wooden girders surrounded by citrus trees. A few of them show people standing behind the find, the finds. The camera, I'm going to repeat it, men stand still silently for a few seconds only. Everyone has been asked not to move not to blink and not to say a word. In the 19th century, you, uh, the exposure time is not a click, it's a little bit more. So you need, you need it not to move. Otherwise, if you move, your image is blurred like many images of some people we saw. They might have been told not even to smile, therefore we don't know if they're happy or not. They have probably not seen a camera before. They may not have seen other men in photographs before they will probably not see this one ever. This photograph will be developed and printed by agents of the Sebah Joyer Institution on site in Sidon or possibly in their atelier in Constantinople. The photograph will be mounted on an off-white cardboard The cardboard will be bound into an album that will be named after the excavation and that will carry the number 91533 and the title Sidon Necropolis, Sidon Lahti. Album 91533 will be part of the Sultan Abdul Hamid's favorite photographic collection, indexed in 51 volumes that cover all aspects of modern life in the empire. It will find its way as a gift to royal and presidential collections in European and American capitals, but not to southern provinces of the empire. Today, in my, um, when I take a picture of a place, I cannot but return to this place and tell them, oh, are you interested in this picture? Do you want a copy? But in, when the power relations are different, photographers don't do this. All album pages and the photographs mounted on them will age over 100 years and turn light yellow. There is no pure white in these photographs anymore. And this is why the light effects that I produce do not match the yellow of the paper. They go beyond it. Therefore, they are a presence coming from a different time from modern time. Some of these men wear official uniforms. They must have been vilayet officials guards in charge of protecting the site against theft. Others must have been workers. Is Osman Hamdi Bey in the picture? I know he is not. Or is he behind the camera? Is Bishara Deeb in it? Is Mahmoud Asi, the marine engineer, in it? Is Muhammad al-Sharif in it? Ironically, none of the two descendants of Sharif and Asi family know how their grandfathers look like. 
Who is Muslim? Who is Christian? If William Eddy, one of the earliest uh, people to write about this excavation before Hamdi Bey uh, arrived, if William Eddy mentions a Muslim walking out of the site with a carved piece of stone in his hands, then people used to be able to tell from appearance who is Muslim and who is uh, not. And if they are indeed able to tell who is who, did they really care? What do these men make of Osman Hamdi Bey? What do they think of Ottoman authorities or Ottoman rule? Do they consider the Ottoman rule as an occupation or is it simply uh, an unchallenged fact, like the sky, like the weather, like the sea? We are here in 1887, 27 years past the killings between Druze and Christian in Mount Lebanon. There have been uh, serious uh, conflicts that led to killing between Christians and Druze in Mount Lebanon in 1860, which caused the French intervention that came to protect the, the Maronites, but also with a scientific mission with an astronaut coming to uh, uh, excavate Byblos, Sidon, and, si and, and, and Sur, Tyr. Therefore, you see the competition and the overlap of what have been seen later by Hamdi Bey as a, a transgression or like as a, a crossing w uh, over the sovereignty line. So, has anyone in the group, uh, sorry, yeah, I was saying, a similar number of years separated my writing of this text to the end of the Lebanese war. I grew up within the Lebanese war and I imagine that they have grown through 1860, judging on how old they are, they all know, have been in 1860. So they know that there is a serious issue that's uh, uh, an extra, another extraordinary event have uh, uh, they have traversed another, uh, an important extraordinary event in 1860, but they are not talking about it. So I say, does anyone remember it? And if anyone does remember it, does remember, would they have rather preferred they forgot? This is how I ended uh, this, uh, this talk. And I think, I think it's better to stop, right? Because I have like another hour that I could speak about uh, where does, because it's important to point that there's a genre of writing uh, uh, uh, archaeological texts about uh, accompanying excavations that, so Hamdi Bey did not invent a, a genre. But, uh, um, for example, if you look at the excavation, I think he did one on Namrut, right, also? But before him, in 1881, uh, uh, Gaston Maspero did also uh, uh, Deir al-Bahari, the excavation of Deir al-Bahari that was transformed later in the, in the early 70s by uh, one of the most amazing thinkers of our times, in my opinion, Shadi Abdus Salam, made a film called Al Mumia about that specific uh, uh, um, moment. So I do belong to this. I'm interested in... Um, mm, I'm not interested if I'm a Muslim or Christian or a Jewish person. I'm interested in all the succession of these uh, uh, religions, civilizations. Uh, and I'm saying this in, in the context of Shadi Abdus Salam's uh, work specifically because he is someone who played with uh, popular culture, he brought the most, like the Monica Vitti of Egypt and, and uh, veiled her and, and put her um, uh, in this village in Al Gurna where she doesn't speak a word. So she is a fossil into a film that made, that lifts the film into a really a conceptual film more than a historical film. Um, so he is able to play with these, um, with popular culture, with the fact that he decided that the film will be spoke in, in, in when his, uh, when, when, when his um, uh, protagonists or the people who play in the film are like these peasants, nevertheless, they speak eloquent uh, Arabic like you read in the Quran. So he is someone who used existing forms as media to, to say what he wants, to say that uh, um, he is someone who, know, who, who would say that what the museum 
is to archaeological artifacts is simply like prostitution, what prostitution does to love. If you want to sell culture, you can. And if you want to sell love, you can. And both of them are not sellable. But our contemporary society uh, has a price for everything. So with the partition of culture and humankind, I would like to end this uh, talk. <laughs> Thank you very much, Akram. Uh, thank you for those great insights and uh, a very different perspective to such a broad topic like this. I just want to say something before I open it to, to the floor. Uh, I was very interested in your sensitivity as a as, a, as an artist with a background of photographic uh, photographic background. So, the overexposures that you showed us protecting the sarcophagi reminded me of something I heard through Boris Groys many years ago when he gave a lecture about, I think, uh, visual depiction in religious societies. Um, he talked about a Muslim cleric who claimed that, maybe it was a Shiite cleric, who claimed that contrary to the other views of depiction, of visual depiction, he was saying, or they were saying, that it's okay to photograph me or another human being, but only with the flesh, because when the flesh is functioning, my soul will be dead at that point. So you are not going to photograph my soul. So I, I remember this when I saw your overexposures. I think this is a very interesting sensitivity. Could only come from somebody like you. If you want to say something else about that overexposure, uh, I mean, I, I've said it, it's like okay. giving more, like, when you put more light than you mm -hmm. need, you actually erase. Disappears, yeah. This is the, yeah. this is the, this is the essence of, um, of the gesture. Mm. But commenting also on, on, photo on, on photography, I grew up using my father's camera. I remember the mm. smell uh, when, when, when, when, when Kiev was, um, it's silly what I, what I will say, but I, it's part of my emotional being. When Kiev was, uh, was being attacked, I was thinking of my Kiev camera. It's like I, I Instagrammed an image of my Kiev camera. Like for me, as a kid, Kiev is the camera. Uh, and um, my interest in the medium comes with, my interest in archaeology comes with uh, months when we lift curfews and you find me digging in my father's closet <laughs> so it's like, it's like even the uh, uh, the curiosity vis-a-vis -vis the past comes from there comes from the also the from from childhood the smell of the leather of the camera the smell of the the uh, um, the special plastic also the solid resin of of of the camera yeah so all what I'm saying is like people who are born today will probably develop without knowing an emotional attachment to lit screens. Mm. Um, now we want to open it to the floor. Please raise your hand. <clears throat> if you have a question, I'll bring the mic to you. Mm. You have one? You have a question? <laughs> um, when we went to the archaeological museum today, um, we visited the new displays and not very many tourists or visitors read the curse of Tabnit. It's written loud and clear there that there is a curse written on the sarcophagi. Yeah, the, like. the curse is a, is a standard curse. It's not. It's really, a standard. I do not take it uh, personally at, at address at, to us. To Tabnit, okay. I, I, I, from my, uh, yeah. So his son's sarcophagus would have the same standard curse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the son's sarcophagus has a more elaborate curse that mentions the mother as well. Okay. The fact that the, because the mother is writing. I mean, by the time Tabnit died, uh, maybe he has written this or uh, decided that this will be written, but the implementation of the gesture is carried by the mm. mother. His son was, uh, has been born the same year as the father died. So mm. the son did not oversee anything of in the burial. 
and even the burial of the son of Ishmun Azar II was overseen by his mother, who was the sister of Tabnit, because that was a brother-sister uh, marriage. Mm. Uh, uh, so the mother is what I like to see uh, as the historian of, of that time. She is the one who secured the burial of Tabnit according to his wishes, and she is the one who invented the how curse. the the son will, will be buried and how the whole package, what will be written. I think what was written also, what was written at two phases when like, you realize that she mentions herself somewhere in, in, in the text. So we say my father is Tabnit and my mother mm. is uh, Omar Shtart. <clears throat> About the curse, I just want to ask a mm -hmm. naughty question. There is a curse that you said it's not pointed at Osman Hamdi, but it's oh, yeah, saying or, like I whoever guess. takes me out, it will be under this curse. But what's the significance of you copying one of the sarcophagi and putting two of them together? Then would it be double curse in your opinion? Yes, I think... How I, do you feel I, about that as yeah, another yeah. excavator? Because I, I don't want to be uh, indulging in the creative uh, side of like producing uh, works before I get the 3D, before I'm allowed to mm. do the 3D uh, but at some point also I, th I said maybe what I will not reproduce in the replica is the curse. I'm not interested in this and I don't think it's reproducible anyway. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but the thing is that people are interested in the curse because they are interested in a Phoenician, a paragraph in Phoenician that makes sense. And when Ernest Renan discovered, uh, was able to decode what's written on the Eshmun Azar's sarcophagus, he was interested because he absolutely was interested to write the history of the civilizations that led to Christianity mm. from a scientific perspective, which is extremely essential for us today not to take Islam as a reference when we talk about the past. So who, whoever kings who were not Muslim, they were not Kafara. So in order to start to write a history, you need to forget about uh, uh, who is Kafir and who is uh, not Kafir. And in, in therefore, you need to place on the same line those who believed in Islam and who, do, who disbelieved in Islam. Mm. Uh, being a Muslim does not elevate um, a, a person beyond another person just for the fact that, which contradicts something that is mentioned in the, in the Quran or in one of the Hadiths. Mm. So, uh, uh, uh, uh, someone like Ernest Renault, the impact of someone like Ernest Renault onto uh, the study of religion is not, I think, it occurred in the minds of Osman Hamdi Bey. It could not have not occurred, right? I mean, I'm, what do you think? It could not have not occurred because it's about looking at religion from an unreligious perspective. And that, that maybe explains why the Ottoman Empire was not interested in establishing laws for archaeology because they are pre-Islamic. We are, we are not, why do we need to care about pre-Islamic societies? But someone like uh, uh, Shadi Abdel Salam the, the, the, is like, no, absolutely. I, he would say, I do not understand. Why, do we, why are we not taught uh, uh, to read ancient Egyptian. You are uh, in modern Egypt. How can you not read? I'm not uh, doing the parallel also with Turkey about the Ottoman Empire. That's another level of, uh, um, it's, yeah, it's really another level of um, uh, constraints to writing history. Mm. So you need, as a researcher or as a historian, you need to liberate yourself from looking at ancient societies through the perspective of, of of religion and this is why something truly exceptional is ha has happened in Saudi Arabia in the past five or ten years yeah so so I don't know how light brought us to this but writing history without the impact and the weight of religion is essential we are in 222 we are not in like an astronaut was working 1850 and we are 2022 hundred and something years afterwards and we are not yet there i'm mm -hmm. saying we as islamic societies or islamic uh, or societies that have um, at different levels um, went beyond religion
Any questions? Any other questions? So then we'll let you go, Akram. Thank you very thank much you very for much. your wonderful presentation. Thank you for coming.